um, I, the breakout sessions around the four big ideas. And to start that off would be Nathan Plowman. Okay, so we had uh, Mapping for Play, and we took Mapping for Play in two different but complementary uh, routes. Um, we had a, a lot of different opportunities, but what we tried to do is synthesize them down into two areas. Um, and also place them within the context of work that we already know is happening because one of the things about mapping is it's going to take a huge amount of effort, institutional, organizational effort to actually get this happening. So the more we can integrate it into things that are already taking place, the better. So the first, um, and this this is the piece that most closely follows the, uh, the demo that we, that we showed at the top today is the idea of using maps to focus resources. So our 10x here is focusing resources. And essentially, the, the product here is, is the baseline. So the baseline is really understanding what we know about play in any given area. Um, it's about aggregating and sharing data across multiple sources. A lot of external data is publicly available, census data. A lot of it is not publicly available. So we need to share data. And just sharing data would be a huge victory. In addition to sharing data, agreeing on common attributes that we want to measure, common nomenclature for those attributes. Um, those are the kind of things that would enable us to create an open API, uh, which is essentially the this, having all the data in one place, which is readily accessible and readable by anyone who wants to read it, rather than being held behind a, um, a firewall or in a language that, that can't be readily understood. So once you have that API, once you have that data in one place, it can be used for multiple applications. Actually, what we think the best application for this idea is likely to be a desktop tool with multiple layers. So very similar to uh, what Michael showed you from the Kaiser work, very similar to what James has with Kaboom already, that you have a map of an area. You can click on any number of attributes to show uh, low-income populations, density of children, um, availability of play, and so on. What we're trying to do with that tool and that product is to mobilize resources and, and quantify demand in order to mobilize those resources. So we show that actually there is a desert here. There's a huge population of kids here who have no access to play. Therefore, this is where you need to, you need to invest. There is demand here. There's no supply here. Um, so that will enable us to focus investments in infrastructure and programming. We might be able to name and shame um, parks that haven't, uh, haven't been kept up, um, shared use facilities which should legally be shared use but aren't currently sharing use in the way that the regulations demand. So we get red flag facilities. We want to drive policy change. And most importantly, we want to coordinate multi-stakeholder resources. So there are lots of groups and organizations trying to do the same good work. And we need to make sure they're not doing exactly the same good work in exactly the same places, but we're actually carving up the territory and saying, okay, you go here, you do your work, we'll go here, we'll do our work, and, and so on. The data we need um, that is commonly available, census data, sports data, uh, Sport and Fitness Industry Association data, NRK data, and so on. More ability scores, let's move out to the schools, where are the schools programs, playworks programs currently in operation. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that we can use. I'm sure we'll find that when you aggregate that data, there are a lot of gaps too. The partners, uh, Community Commons, Esri, the sort of the gold standards of doing this kind of work would ideally bring in some big tech players, Google, Microsoft, for example, community deals, policymakers federal government in the form of CDC to, to sort of verify what we're talking about here is a common attributes and non, non words to describe things. <laughs> um, to make sure the federal government is actually involved and, uh, and has visibility to what we're doing. Where we, where we thought we might be able to put something like this is an initiative like the Oregon Healthy State Initiative for the benefit of those who don't know the governor of Iowa has challenged the governor of Oregon to become the healthiest state in the country by 2018. Iowa is currently 12, Oregon is 27, a lot of work to be done. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, it's an initiative led by the governor in which he hopes to get between 20 and 40 organizations working towards that common goal. There is no way that 20 to 40 organizations are going to be able to work towards a common goal with the best intentions in the world without some kind of organizing tool or framework. And this kind of map could be exactly that. It could be the, the single resource that everyone looks at to really understand where collectively we need to focus our resources and build on and leverage each other's strengths. So that is the first idea. That's the sort of uh, the policy change maker, techie desktop idea. Which we love. 
The second one, the 10x here, is actually mobilizing you. So the, 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 the big sort of lever here is to energize and engage you, the people who are going to be the key beneficiaries of this work um, to drive that behavior change at scale. The first thing they can do and really help out is in filling the data gaps. So what we, what I alluded to in the first piece is there are a lot of things that we don't know that the official data just simply won't tell us. They'll tell us that there's a park in a certain area. They won't tell us how good that park is, what the inventory in that park is like, whether people actually go there, or whether it's full of drug addicts. No one knows. So we can use youth to actually crowdsource to fill those data gaps. Um, they can give us qualitative feedback on those play spaces. Um, as James said, no one would go to Yelp if there were no reviews on Yelp. So just having the baseline, knowing what's there, is no use at all. We want to know what it is like. Um, they can give us constant feedback on inventory. Um, and they can also track sort of the could be play areas that aren't going to show up on official maps. So, you know, underneath the freeway flyover or a Costco parking lot on a weeknight when it's only a third full. Places that could be repurposed for play, which we would just never see through official means. But, you know, we have the, our instinct is that kids know where you can play far better than we do. Um, the second piece is then to actually engage them in, in advocacy to improve those facilities. So if we can elevate their voice to policymakers and say, listen, listen to what youth in your area are telling you about their demand for, their need for play, and what they think the facilities they currently have. Um, demonstrate the demand that's actually going to drive policy. That's the second piece. The third piece is using this tool to recreate serendipitous play. So how can you truly understand where young people are, children and young people are, because they're not necessarily in those fields of dreams or those facilities. They want to play in the neighborhood at the bus stop wherever it might be. Really understanding their journey through the day and opening up unconventional places for play, places for play. So not just tracking the parks and the schools, but the unconventional places. What they want to know is where are my friends playing now? Not give me a database of all parks in the city. Where are my friends playing now? And I will go and play with them. Um, it might also get us to some kind of sense of safety in numbers. We've talked about the, the white van syndrome that, that, that parents don't want to let kids out of their sight, don't want, let, don't want to let them go even to the next block or around the corner to a park because they don't know what might happen to them. If they know that there's a group of 20 kids getting together, possibly with one parent adult supervisor, they're far more likely to, to let those kids go and play. So um, that kind of pop-up play, how can we, how can we uh, enable kids to come together and play when they want to, when they want to? So what that looks like as a tool, I mean, we call it dynamic mapping. So the map isn't just a static map with an inventory on it. It's a real-time, living, breathing map which shows you where, where people are playing right now. It's like four square for play, so you can check in in a play area when you when you arrive there. It's Snapchat, meets GPS, meets mapmyrun.com. It's that whole crowdsourced social media, social network kind of idea. So the partners who need this, I mean, take your pick, but basically social network, social media. Uh, a code of farm group, maybe Code for America, who could say, okay, we've got the API, we know where the places are to play, how can you build that, how can you integrate that into some kind of social networking that enables kids to uh, contribute to the API and update it with their qualitative perceptions of the play spaces they have, and also feed from it and understand where they can go right now to play. And the uh, potential place for this land is at Kaboom's Playful City USA, where there are eight mayors of cities coming together. Those cities are already playful cities. They already have, to some degree, the baseline that we talked about. So they have that inventory. They have, they've mapped out the play deserts. And they're probably in a good position to actually take it to this next stage and enable this kind of mobilization of youth aspect um, to build on what they on the work that they've already done. So you have, so in both examples, you've got uh, buy-in from the highest level, whether it's the governor of Oregon or the mayors of this city, they have access to multi-department budgets. Uh, it's a cross-sector geographic initiative with a, a fixed goal to get the, the, the community more active. And if we are able to place these ideas into those existing programs, we feel we might make progress. Any quick comment or uh, suggestion to round out either of these ideas? Excellent. Bravo. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Okay, so what I'd like to do is, uh, Tim, let's let's tee up the next uh, poll here. Oh, question. Struck me that real estate agents and offices would be very interested in some of that data about play. That's a strong. Yeah. So we'll talk about how do you make the one of the problems with the data is any data that has commercial value is readily collected. Data that doesn't have commercial value is not. So you have to make the case that mapping play is of commercial value to people like real estate agents. You, so we're just starting to see walkability scores appear in listings now. That's clearly a value to would-be homeowners. And we can imagine that play might be too. The flip side of that is many people don't have the, the opportunity to decide where they live. So <laughs> they're not in the real estate market. So we have to somehow make the, the data collection affordable in, in those places too. Great. Okay, so Tim, let's uh, tee up the first question. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, there we have the little clickers. <laughs> How effective could the mapping for play idea be uh, in getting kids more active and participating in sports on a scale of one to five, five being the most effective? And uh, Nathan actually threw out two ideas, so you get two bites at the apple here. So just vote on, you know, if either of these ideas, your favorite idea, where would it, where would it ring? Why don't you do it twice? Do do it twice? Okay. Uh, the first idea of Nathan's group. Uh, so the first idea. Uh, what do we uh, scale one to five? Go ahead and vote. All right. What do we got, Tim? All right. Okay. That's pretty good. Forty-five percent is three. Perfect. Now, what about uh, idea number two? Let's do that. Sure. 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 Okay. Are we ready, Tim? Yeah. Okay. All right, let's vote on idea number two. Right. Can you go to the slide? There you go. All right. <laughs> okay, we have. No, no more enthusiasm for right here, number two. Uh, like we're just going to keep going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take the third idea. <laughs> All right, very good. Very good. All right, so um, next I'd like to bring up, I think it's Hans. Is, uh, are you pronounced? Yeah. Okay, come on up. All right. All right. We were doing technology. Yes, this is awesome, isn't it? Let's <laughs> vote. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Our team was pretty awesome, and it was very interesting. Particularly, uh, one especially interesting um, aspect of this was. Who was seated around the table? And I'm just gonna just kind of lay this out quickly for you. We had coaches, that would be the Martins. We had youth, that would be Aaron. And me, I don't matter. Um, then there's uh, we had uh, Lance, who is he creates. I'm sorry, what did I say his name there? Uh, he is actually creating um, a. How would you describe it, Lance? In like one word. Is Lance with us? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one word. How about uh, two? Did you do? It's a game to try to get kids and families more physically active. Okay, so it's like it's an activity. Uh, it's like a structured activity incentivize yeah. incentive. Yeah, with a hardware and software combination. All right, so okay, so this is like a hardware software um, 
vendor for incentive, okay? He's, he's, making, he's making hardware and software to incentivize. Then we had um, <coughs> Carolyn, who is a game from a game developer, okay? Game developer. And we had a game designer. I'm going to loosely call him that. He's a UX designer. That's uh, W. Mike. Okay? And then we have Aspen Institute. And the reason I do this is because is I'm, I'm showing you this is because I'm trying to lay the groundwork for some of the motivations. You can already begin to see some of the motivations and in, in, in the people who would be involved in this. Um, interestingly enough, it was our youth guy, Aaron, who came up with the, the first kind of use case that led into the idea that we all think it has some, has some uh, legs on it. And we're calling it just for the moment for the sake of being able to refer to it tersely, Bitcoin. There's a lot of friction currently, if you want to think about it that way, in the system of incentivizing children. And as I look back on what Gopi said, thanks to Tom and whoever else was involved in Google for bringing Gopi in, because what he talked about in, in part, right, is this big ambitious project, for sure, you want to go for that. But you also want to try and engage as the, the powers of the world, everyone in the world in this. And you have a lot of people represented here. I would also put in uh, to, this, to this group parents who are interested in this problem. Inspirers, okay? Coaches are inspirers. Um, but we wanted to come up with a solution that, that could take the crowd and, and, and offload some of that burden to them. And the question really is, inspiring children, oops, sorry, Inspiring kids and using the, 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 the medium of the video game or the channel of the video game to do it. These are all players, these are all people involved in some degree in this question, uh, aspects of this question. And inspiring, we want to reduce friction. So we want to make it, we want to facilitate. This particular solution or idea is about facilitating or reducing friction in the provision of or engaging crowds easily as easily as possible to incentivize children to be more fit. And we can come back to that in a minute. But if you look at if you look at this, here's the child right here, and he has in his hand the device, which every child basically is going to have or has and is connected. And behind it, maybe you have a, a game platform or console or something here. And basically the conversation between the inspirers and the kid is a really challenging one right now. Very challenging conversation. They're all trying to get a word in to say, hey, go outside. Go play something. Go do something. And he is really walled off, or she is really walled off in that, and a lot of their attention is right here. It's really. So the idea is, how do we consolidate through the game engine all these different words of encouragement and inspiration, okay? All these disparate points of view and, and, and efforts to touch, to touch on the kids and say, hey, let's incentivize you, inspire you to do something active. Well, What Aaron suggested was, he said, listen, here I am over here, here's the kid over here, and he wants to have fun. <clears throat> and he has, let's say he's playing Counter-Strike, which is a, which is like a first-person shooter, and he has characters, or let's say, let's say, let's, let's say get, make it even more sports applicable, it's directly applicable, let's say he's playing FIFA soccer. Okay, some game that models human performance. He said, what if I could do some kind of physical activity that would, that would increase my my character's capability. So in other words, in the game, my character can shoot, run, pass, be agile, based on whether or not I am. Okay? So if I, if I want to invest the time and activity in being fast and in demonstrating it, I get a faster character in my game. Okay? This is a very interesting idea. And it basically gave, gave rise to this, this question of, how do we how do we create a portable currency for activity? And we'll give that that activity currency uh, shout out to Lance because that was his term. But an activity currency that kids could collect and exchange for increased performance, leveling up, bonuses, in-game purchases. So it's a, it's a type of incentive, right? But the question is. It's not unique to each individual person in this chain of influence, right? 
Each person in this little in this sphere of influence here is incentivizing this kid on a custom one-to-one -one basis, and they're like, hey, hey, if uh, if like I say to my son, okay, you want to play 30 minutes of game time? That's cool. You got to go out and do today's what? Today's exercise. It's gonna be run around the, the yard four times with your uh, with your arms over your head, and so he does it. He goes and he does it. That's very custom. And it's very in a way inefficient. What this is, is trying to get at is a, a, current, a, a currency for activity that the kid can basically carry with him or her and can use in the game networks, in the game itself, to, to get improved player performance. Okay, So game in, in performance, they can get uh, leveled up. If you guys don't know what that means, leveling up may mean that you get to, you get to go to hidden levels, you get to proceed further in the game. All right? So these are incentives, fun incentives for the kid within the game, and they're based on this, this what we're calling just temporarily, or for the sake of argument, Bitcoin. All right. So I can get Bitcoin. I can demonstrate that I'm fit, and I'll say, let's say I have a, I have five, five points in my profile for the 100 meter dash, and I have strength. I have 10 for strength, and I have for uh, agility. I have 20, and that maps through some sort of transfer function to. Um, to my in-game character, or it can be used to influence other incentives. Okay, or we can we can aggregate draw purchasing power for for in-the-game purchasing. So here is where it starts to get interesting. Where does this come from? Well, like any economy, right? The currency is going to be introduced into the system. The market is going to have currency introduced into the system by banks, and those are going to be we'll call them banks. That maybe is not the right word to use. But this would be perhaps gyms. They say, listen, Joey, if you come, we will measure your 100 yard dash and we will certify that you've got this many fit coin and then you can go and re 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 you know, uh, redeem it in your game and play in the game. So the gym is able to incentivize the child. Coaches, you, the list goes on and on and on. Coaches, the, coaches let's see, parent, well, let's say PE teachers, right? But what about this? What about attendance at, or becoming part of a team? If you're part of a team, there is a bonus, which is portable in Bitcoin, for re redemption in the game context. All right. Also, it can come this direction, where kids having gotten Bitcoin in one in, in Bitcoin can redeem it for something else. So let's say that they get Bitcoin from static sensors like a pedometer. All right, so this sort of thing is already being done in uh, uh, Club Penguin for Disney. Who was it that told me that just a little while ago? So, thank you. Yes, Nathan. Club Penguin for Disney uh, is doing this with like a static sensor, a pedometer. The, large, the kid walks a certain, the child walks a certain amount. They can redeem it in the game for certain in-game incentives. Very, very uh, popular, it turns out. And Disney just bought um, one of the static sensor providers. <laughs> Things like the Connect come into this. The Connect is more than capable of saying to a, to, a, to a child for whom going outside or going to a gym or going and joining a team is too difficult, saying, hey, you want to get a faster character? You want to get X, Y, or Z in-game bonus? Do 10 squats and do them fast. The Connect can assess that. The Connect can absolutely assess body position. Gross body position, do frog jumps, right? It's not that we're, we're talking about any particular gag, any specific gag, but that we're going after the big, the big thing, which is to reduce the friction between those who can incentivize, like parents and teachers, and those who are being incentivized, the kids, through, the, through their chosen vehicle, their preferred vehicle of communication, what is, the game engine, right? The games. We're putting their fitness, their activity in some portable currency. This is also, I take you right back to, uh, to this little time. Okay. This is the kind of a thing that an Aspen Institute is great at. Because this is a this is a matter of a standard, right? What do standards do? Standards like telephony standards, NTSC standards for broadcast. Uh, standards for Morse code, standards for XML, data transmission, et cetera, et cetera. What do standards do? They serve as a point of agreement that makes economies emerge. Okay, and so instead of everyone having to struggle to find a custom way to incentivize the child for to be active, 
or a new game to have to be built, there is a common standard for expressing that, and that can be exchanged, and it can be portable. I don't know if, you're, if, if I'm making sense here or if I'm expressing it cleanly. It's interesting. Look again. Game for designer, game developer, um, a hardware software vendor for the sensors, coaches, and the youth themselves. Every one of them contributed into this idea because everyone said, whoa, that makes total sense. That makes total sense. Now I have reduced, I can, I, can, I can incentivize the way I incentivize. So this guy, let me put it this way, the gym is incentivized to promote athletic events, okay, or athletic promotions in the game platform. Games can be constructed now to operate around external or out exterior outside physical activity that is rewarded or measured in Fitcoin, which is portable into the game environment. Okay? You can see how PE teachers can easily incentivize. They don't have to cook up something custom and call the game company, can you build a game for me? None of that. They are, they, are, they are able very, very cleanly to go through a standard. So what we're going after here is the ability to enable all these people to incentivize the, kid, the child through his or her chosen vehicle easily, to inspire them easily. And that's kind of with this idea of Bitcoin. Any of the guys in our group have pieces of this that I have neglected to mention? Please. Yes, ma'am. Um, just two quick points. One, I think, is that the, the key to this idea is just the merging of your video games and physical, you know, athletic or, or events, right? And, and allowing those to go um, in two directions. And I think um, a key point um, to this is that the video game industry um, is in need of good news. Right, on these side things. So being on the right side, so there's an incentive for the industry to lead in helping kids be physically fit because it is what the primary kind of knock on or one of the primary knocks on the industry. So I think there is incentive for game developers to invest the time and resource to connect a Fitbit or um, or something else just bundled with the hardware, allowing kids physical activity to allow them to level up in their game. Yeah. So the, the this is and this is something again right in the in the sweet spot for an Aspen Institute, which can can talk to so many different interests, bring them together to form a standard. Game designers have now a new interface or a common language in which to build totally different games. Totally different, different games that are that are structured around actual physical activity in the real world, even communal activity. Game developers have a real chance. Uh, big studios like EA or Microsoft have a real chance of better PR. You see, the whole if you participate in that Bitcoin economy or that Bitcoin market, you're doing a good thing. There's nothing about it that's venal, right? There's nothing about it that's purely mercantile in a sense. You're participating and and opening up your games to accept Bitcoin or produce uh, your 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 uh, your particular uh, shop to, to produce Bitcoin. Um, and that's kind of the idea that we're going for is the enablement of if a, if, listen, if a coach comes up with a great idea, he says, I want to run quarter mile tomorrow. Anybody who runs to quarter mile tomorrow, now he's able to say, I'm going to incentivize you in your video game. How would you do that now? You can't. But if you had, if he had a common language, a standard, he could say, listen, I'm going to incentivize everybody who runs a quarter mile tomorrow gets 100 Bitcoin. And it immediately has value or incentive in the video game. So not to be the dead horse. Also, uh, one thing we also talked about is this, this is such a big idea. Potentially, if we made this ecosystem work for all the different uh, participants and all the different disciplines that you talked about, we could actually uh, really end up on the right side of the issue of having a generation of kids that are more fit in five or ten years because they love games. We know that we have to be more active as a, as a society. So this, this could actually help lead us there, along with all the other ideas that we discussed. Yes. So let me quickly just run through our assets. The things that we identified as assets we have available, lots of sensor technology. We have more than enough sensor technology to make this happen passively. So we can, we can basically 
have a, in, uh, an approach to this, we can lower the opportunity cost for, any, for just about any kid who can play a video game. Um, he doesn't have to be out, out in the open and go to a gym, for example. But if he does go to a gym and the gym owner wants to incentivize children to do good activity, he can do it through video games. The games model uh, human performance. We have games like FIFA and Madden that just really focus on modeling human performance already and are ready for tie-ins. Web services standards that are an infrastructure that are already there for the communication of various pieces and various interests that have to, have to emerge to form a standard like this. A huge group of consumers are hungry for, for this kind of a thing, for, that are playing games, and there's a hunger for good PR, as Carolyn uh, mentioned. Most kids are already connected, and um, banks are attracted. This is an attractive, um, this is an attractive thing for the people who sit on the vendors or the broker side of this, or the production of, of Bitcoin. Needs that we have. Industry evangelization. It's got to be taken and, and sell this idea in the industry. Um, a, a Bitcoin standard uh, for how it's, you know, this profile of the, of, the kid, of the child and his or her performance capability is persisted and transported, as well as the ability to, to aggregate and to reduce that, that, those, uh, those numbers of Bitcoin in their account. Um, games tuned for it or new games altogether. You know, someone mentioned geocaching. That was a big discussion at our table. Uh, the ability to have games in the real-world physical context, either augmented, such as uh, through through uh, vehicles such as uh, Google Glass. Uh, Google also has released the game Ingress after about a one-year beta. The game Ingress is like a geo geocaching on stories. Uh, I'm sorry, on steroids, that is structured around a very rich backstory, and it's outside in the real world. Something you can look up later. I, I know that I got to move along here. Um, Figure out why or how do kids want that Bitcoin? Why do they want it for itself? Do we do we kind of make it a subordinate? Uh, you know, kind of we don't focus on it for the children themselves, but they focus on games that are more fun. Uh, key business partnerships, high-level advocacy, and exchange rates. Those exchange rates, for example, the 100-meter dash is worth however many Bitcoin. So there you are. That's our idea. Awesome. So I don't want to prejudice the uh, the, the poll results here, but let's pull up the. Uh... The same question. Do we want to uh, do we want to ask for questions from the, from the crowd? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you did a little bit of that, but yeah, you have um, one or two quick ones. We uh, we got to get Ginny out of here by five o'clock. Is there an industry? I know there's a consumer electronics association. Is there an industry body for games makers? Yeah. Is there? Yeah. What is it? The uh, That might be a place to enter it. You know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So the Bitcoin standard would that, that kind of reach the obese kid who can barely get off the couch? Would there be different levels like beginner, intermediate, advanced? Yes, absolutely. Um, what it provides is a way to quantify physical activity and give it to the kid in a portable form. How they get that that piece that let's say one Bitcoin, you get one Bitcoin for lifting one finger. Okay, static sensing can do that automatically. So that the child who is who is reclusive, who doesn't want to get off the couch, can still get success, and success will breed further success, right? If he succeeds in, at incrementing or, or raising his Bitcoin balance and having more fun in the game by raising a finger, he's now more likely to raise two fingers. That, that's one thing that's been proved, you know, to be true. It is that, that encouragement and success breed more success. So yeah, so through passive sensor and then all the way you can scale the encouragement or the inspiration, the use of that Bitcoin to whatever scale you want, really on the, on the back end, and levels of complexity, like sports teams. So you have in-game promotions that pop up and say, hey, you're able to do squats really fast. Have you considered joining our team down at the YMCA down the road? That is totally possible, completely possible, as well as all the social times. But Rather than us focusing on specific technological stunts, like one-offs, like we're going to do a tie-in with Facebook, or we're going to do a tie-in with this, or we're going to use GIS data, or what, it seems to me that this is, this, is a, this is a bigger thing that would enable all that to happen more easily, in the same way that uh, XML or some kind of uh, lingua franca allows various people in a given market to, to, to interchange data and interchange um, value. Anyone else? Okay, sorry, I've probably gone way too long. Yeah, no worries. And we, listen, we don't. We can continue. We expect to continue this conversation and develop it further. So there will be other opportunities, and we'll talk about how to do that coming out of the meeting. So this isn't over with. Okay, good. Uh, let's vote real quickly. Um, 
How effective could the active video game idea, uh, the Bitcoin idea, uh, be for getting kids more active and participating in sports? Five being the most effective. Okay, there we have. All right. Good level of enthusiasm. How about that? Congratulations, guys. Good work. Okay, so um, I'd like to actually bring up uh, Jenny Ehrlich now, CEO of the Clinton uh, Health Matters Initiative of the Clinton Foundation. She has to run. She has a 5 o'clock flight. She was going to come at the end of this session to explain how we can take these ideas and turn them into action. Um, or 5 o'clock cab. She has her Learjet waiting right outside the, uh, <laughs> the parking lot here. So, uh, Jenny, uh, let's come up and tell us what you're doing and uh, how you can be helpful. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, I um, I don't have a 5 o'clock flight and I'm flying coach, but uh, thank you for uh, letting me uh, <laughs> um, your intermission um, here. So I um, wanted to spend just a few minutes explaining um, uh, the Clinton Foundation's partnership with the Aspen Institute around Project Play and what you can expect um, from hearing from me after, after this session. You know, the Clinton Health Matters Initiative focuses on looking at how we can reduce chronic disease overall across the United States, cradle to grave, with a very specific focus on how we close those health disparity gaps, how we make sure, in this case, that the triangle that Tom showed at the beginning becomes that rectangle or square, so that all kids really have access to the opportunities uh, to bring to bear. What we, what we are is we're a how and a do group, so um, in this uh, partnership, we're really serving as the activation arm. And uh, we're doing that using uh, three different strategies that we use across our initiative. One is that we build out multi-sectoral partnerships and voluntary agreements, much like have been described by um, um, the past two uh, speakers that we need to do, really bringing to the table all of the different various assets, NGOs, uh, philanthropy, business, technology, et cetera, to say, how are we going to solve this problem and how are we going to make this work and how are we going to build a solution together? That's really what we're going to be uh, focusing on as a follow-up to this meeting in the spirit of um, ship and iterate and fail well. Um, so between now and when the January report comes out, we're going to try to do some of these quick and rapid fire testings with all of you who are really enthusiastic about activating. So that uh, when we uh, launch this broader report, we can say, here's what we've already learned, here's what's going to work, and here's what we can really replicate and bring to scale. That's something else that we um, will be working with groups that make what we call commitments to action um, to do is to kind of help support the replication, the scale process, et cetera. Um, you heard earlier um, that Scott Blackman from the OSOC and Chris Snyder made a commitment to action around really um, generating um, agreements with 47 um, NGBs. And we'll be working with the USOC and others in terms of that replication process um, and, and others along the way. So uh, that's one piece that we bring. We also work around digital innovation and platform. Uh, for one example, we've uh, hosted four healthy codathons this past year with Tumblr, Jawbone, and the Ace Hotels. We put a twist on the codathons in that um, within our quotathons, we have a framework where uh, sensor data are used and counted toward the final score. So steps and sleep are used and counted um, toward the final score of the teams. Uh, we uh, only serve food that meets certain nutritional guidelines, and we limit the hours from 9 to 5 and have physical activity breaks throughout. So, um, you know, those are um, the resources we can offer for other types of codesons. We don't necessarily need to sponsor them, be part of them, but we can kind of offer lessons learned and, and um, you know, kind of create walk-the-top codesons um, in, in the process. And then we work with communities across the country to kind of broadly transform health, much like the Oregon Healthiest State idea was. So what you'll, um, what you'll, what will happen is that we'll be reaching out to all of you afterwards asking if you want to be involved and engaged in activating some of these ideas. And then we'll convene you through Google chat, through 
um, in-person meetings through phone calls to re for those who say they want to be a part of a certain idea. And we'll start trying to kind of get some of those that momentum going so that we can have some real life examples to talk about as this report is out and so that we can start testing ideas that can be scaled. So for example, as an Oregonian, we're going to test the Oregon Healthy Estate idea, but we're not giving it to Iowa until 2016. That one will not go to scale so that we can kind of get a little head start, right, Nathan? So uh, um, joking. But um, you know, I think um, you know, those are some of so, some of the things you'll see from us. So hopefully you'll um, um, want to kind of build the momentum and maintain the momentum we have here and really test and try some of these things and be a part of the activation. Question? I'm sorry that I have to do this as an intermission, but hopefully this will see the next two groups in terms of, of thinking and look forward to talking with all of you. Thanks. <laughs> And so uh, we're going to bring up the next two uh, presentations. But after that, uh, we're going to, um, Julia from Google is going to uh, introduce this new Google community that we're uh, creating around these four big ideas, as well as uh, you know, interval training and, uh, and summer and summer break, where you guys can push, push these ideas forward, uh, dump your notes, uh, continue to collaborate, and Ginny will be part of that. Julia will show you how to actually use this link that's going to be sent to you in this community. Um, that we're creating. So let's move on with the next presentation. Um, that would be um, Chris and, uh, and Jane. And this would be on the killer app for healthy living. Yeah. I don't know if Jane's still on the line. Or... Yes, I am. Oh. Can you hear me? I'm on the line. Tell me when to go. Can you hear us? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can. Yeah. Okay. So Jane, I just asked. I brought Chris up here to since he's in person and he has the uh, he has the easel and he wrote down some ideas. So between the two of you, maybe you guys can uh, summarize what uh, what you came up with. Sure, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to start by thanking everybody who participated in the round table. Um, the ideas were fast, furious, and, and really incredible. We started out the day talking about the, the killer app and the need to educate, motivate, and engage. And we feel that uh, as a result of this type of uh, app that can be developed, and, and congratulations to Chris and the USOC, that we truly felt that we can build upon what was already developed and, and the hard work that Chris has already done. We looked at what should be engaged inside this killer app, and, and we all agree that it should be skill contact that's age-appropriate development, starting from the very young child to the elite athlete. Um, we looked at assessment to analyze skill and provide immediate or as close to immediate feedback, motivation, ideas for the coach, teacher, and mentor to increase their communication skills, and um, also looked at mental fitness where a, an athlete can write down what their feelings are through journalism, journaling and deciding whether it should be private or shared with the coach. Um, we looked at some big ideas which we would have um, the contact uh, including youth with disabilities as well as multilingual so that we can engage all communities. Um, one of the issues that we know that an app can do is also level the playing field for, for equitable access in areas with low socioeconomic income where youth may not be engaged in going to a camp by a, a professional athlete or a summer program that may charge excessive amount, but having an app that has professional athletes and, and Olympians uh, on the app really levels the playing field on the quality of instruction that they'll be receiving. Um, we looked at um, some of the barriers that uh, were identified in of course, it was cost of the build out, who would have ownership, the licensing, um, branding, um, engaging absolutely and launching from the work of the USOC, in, engaging in future conversation, the President's Council on Fitness, Sports and Nutrition, and, and assuring that the apps are quality and, and some way to engage in, in scoring the type of app. And the um, 
kind of uh, inf you know information might be the number of likes or some kind of scoring in that respect. And we know that the final app should be scalable, and it should be scalable to all end users. It should be scalable to education, youth sports, recreation departments, and affordable, if not free, um, to everybody engaged, um, whether it's administrators, coaches, teachers, mentors, or um, the kids themselves. We know key partnerships should include the content sources, development, distribution, and um, just to really bring it together, the work by the USOC in, in this app development has been incredible. And being that the product is already in development, it, it would make sense to build on and build out from that product. So, um, you know, Chris, I'd like for you to, to add to that, that very brief um, recap of what we discussed. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was fun to sit at the table and talk about ideas. Um, it was even more cool to sit there and say, wow, I kind of have this going on. And all it would take is a little bit of adjustment of what the Olympic Committee is doing. Right now, what I wrote down, Jane, on the, the paper is the user-focused ideas we talked about were how does, this, how does an app actually speak across if you're an educator, if you're working on youth participation, or you're actually working on high-performance competition. Right now, the app we have is for all 47 of the NGBs. They want to. They can put all the resources on it. Their membership coaches can get into it, and they can see all the NGBs' resources on how to coach that sport. You can also then flip over and see all the Olympic Committee's resources on how to teach your athletes on nutrition, strength and conditioning, technology, um, psychology. So you actually get what we have, what we've been giving our Olympians over in Sochi, what we gave them in Beijing and London, those actual one-page resources we use around nutrition. That's extreme value because you can hit the share button and actually give it to the actual athletes to use. Um, so now you've got a trusted content and a valued brand, both the sport and the Olympic Committee, working together to give you safe and qualified filtered actual resources. So what we do right now is on the, the competition scale, you know. Most of our NGBs are working on the highly the high performance area of it, sport performance side of it. But why couldn't we do a version of it for youth participation? We talked, you know, about like USU soccer. How couldn't we empower those youth participation coaches that are out there to have resources at their fingertips they could use on the field? How could we then for educators, physical educators, how could they have a version that allows them access to all the sports that are on our system so when they go from teaching badminton to soccer to archery to shooting, they wouldn't have to be a member of all 47 governing bodies, which is how it's set up right now. you got to be a member to get the benefits. So it's free if you're a member and you get all the other benefits of a governing body, but for a PE teacher to pay 50 bucks 47 times is unrealistic. Could we make a version that's scaled for them that's accessible and how do we find ways to make it free or as close to free as we humanly can? And that's a cool thing when you have the Olympic Committee here, and I'm the guy I'm sitting there challenging myself saying, how do we make it free? How do we get everybody to use it? Because that's going to grow our base at the bottom. The more kids playing sports, the more Olympians we have at the top. It's a no-brainer. But how do we actually fight that, uh, that budget bind, and how do we fight that, uh, that revenue bond and, and just actually get it out there? So that's kind of the cool thing. So all the adaption we have to do to what we're doing right now is we've got to think across two other parallels. You know, into the educator, into the youth participant more, and then continue to get our governing bodies on board. So far we've got 13, another 17 are targeted in this year um, to try to jump on the system, both able body and Paralympics. Um, Paralympics, we're going to have at least seven by the end of this year that are on our system. We already have, I think, three built out. Um, so it's pretty rad that we can just adjust what we're doing now and just think more inclusively than exclusively, and that's kind of the challenge. Um, but the cool thing is, I oh, got excited when I saw this is actual reality. That it could happen, man. So the more people have questions, the more people push and think it's a, a good idea it could happen. Um, I don't see a reason why we couldn't. So, anything else, Shane? No, I, I think that's it. I, I think that it's really doable, um, scaling down from the elite athlete to what can be done in, in the classroom. Um, and again, the scalability, the affordability, whether it's subscription-based, or free total. Um, it's an educational tool that uh, would really increase professional development, will provide access to quality programming, and I think this would be a killer app that uh, will work. Cool. Questions? Comments? Criticisms? Alright. Yeah. What, what might be uh, the, the depth of content on a sports-specific basis? Is there a minimum number of pages or maximum number of pages or 
uh, you know, links, um, you know, how, uh, uh, you know, down into the, into the really basic kinetic movements do you get? So, like, with the, what we currently do right now is we kind of leave it up to the governing body. Some of them has as few as 30, 40 different resources on there in five or six different areas. Others, like USA Boxing, have, my God, it's around 100 or so. Um, so it's really up to them to figure out how do you actually give coaches resources that are actually usable in the field. And it's funny, because in our conversations, Jay, I mean, we are talking about we could put everything under the sun and it would be great from an educator standpoint, but from an end user standpoint, I've got too much. And it's not filtered the right way. And how do we use, like we are talking about, how do we utilize YouTube and YouTube, utilize the actual people in the field doing the work to filter that to the governing body who then could be the actual gatekeeper of efficiency or effectiveness. And here's quality content versus not quality content. So the volume of what's in there to start, it varies. you know. But once you get a good start, what's cool, we've seen this from many of our governing bodies. And we've already done this with sport of lacrosse, sport of hockey, have more expensive apps that are just their own. They've got hundreds of resources in it. They've got everybody under the sun wanting to contribute to get in on that, to send resources in to get on that system. So, but the, the big thing is, you know, how do you get that trusted, valued, safety, quality control filter that you're actually giving people stuff that's usable in an age-appropriate, developmentally appropriate way that's, you know, positive coaching style, that's, that's the right stuff for the right people compared to just a lot of stuff for a lot of people. So you're right, that's the challenge that comes to it. Um, but the cool thing is, man, these iPads and iPhones that we have capture quality that was unreal about five years ago. So anybody can be their own director or their own, their own uh, videographer nowadays. So content um, can produce itself. It's, can we figure out a way that's manageable for the real people to make it happen? Yeah. I also wondered, and you probably talked about this in the group, but you have such great sponsors. I mean, I have a YouTube and I work on sponsorship deals with you. So it's of awesome sponsors. And if you think that they're going to sponsor content from other places that can make the app free for lots of high school coaches who can't even pay, wouldn't even pay the $50 because they don't know what they're accessing because they're, you have the ad supported content on the site, if that was something you might consider for a different, and maybe you have two different versions, like the non ad supported, you can pay your membership and they're not. Yeah. Yeah, and you know it's funny. Like Jane and our group are all talking about that. Of how do you make it universally accessed? They make it free. Um, we've talked numerous times just in what we're currently doing. Of we give the power back to the NGB to sell the actual hard content, the video content that's in there. You also see down the road, do we go for a sponsor? We make it so that way it's more available to all the NGBs and cheaper. Um, we've thought of these ideas. We work in a build it now, and we'll figure out how to pay for it later. Kind of world when it comes to things. Show me you've got lots of views, and then we'll figure out who's going to pay for this. Because we don't want to under, you know, big companies. We don't want to undercharge for things. But Jane, back to our idea of like getting this in the physical education teacher's hands. Yeah, maybe it's a subscription service, but maybe there's a way to offset it through grants and other organizations come to the table and say, we'll make this available to everybody in the metropolitan area. We'll make this available to everybody in the rural area. So you're right, sponsored content, other great ad ideas that don't take away from the actual core theme of things. Oh, Jane, do you think that's probably a way that we could fund it for all those different groups? There's always there's always a way to funding, but the question is is not can we afford it? The real question is can we afford not to do this if we're going to get more kids involved in sport and get more adults that are teachers, coaches, and mentors uh, to the quality level that our kids are getting adequate opportunity for quality sport, sport experiences. Anything else? If we go to the vote, <laughs> we're excited to see if this actually can work. Uh, I might be totally wrong, we might get all ones. Okay, finally we have uh, Jeremy. Like a supply and demand. There are an awful lot of people at your table. A lot of people at the table. How you wrangled all those cats, I'm not quite sure. But you, 
I think as Marisa pointed out, I think I'm the only thing standing between the demand for a drink and the supply of it. Uh, so, so I'll be, I'll be mindful of, of that in, uh, in the length of uh, uh, our presentation. So we had a great group, uh, yeah, a very high demand group. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I think if you start thinking about some of the problems or challenges that were discussed earlier today or in many of the reports and analysis through the, the previous conversations in Project Play, you think about some of the challenges that parents face in keeping kids engaged or getting them to participate to begin with, right? It may be a question of them being able to find an experience that's really engaging for their kid or finding the right organization that has great coaches that are trained with a, an amazing app that Chris and Jane are going to create. Uh, it may be a question of a parent in a lower income area that has concerns around safety or um, uh, after school availability or transportation that if they only knew where they could get information or to find the right kind of activity that met those needs, they might have their kids participate but weren't, weren't able to do so. Uh, it may also be a question of a, a child that is, in only, is focused on one or two sports but that's not really the right fit but if they only knew about CrossFit for kids, think about you know, how uh, empowering that can be and, and their excitement. So what we really focus on is, is the vision of creating a tool for parents and kids to discover the right local sports experiences for their children and increase their participation in sport. Right? This ability of, of, of being able to discover these, these, the right experiences. And I should say it's, it could both be for parents, but in some cases could be kids themselves. They're the ones that are going to use this tool to be able to figure this out. And the core elements of this, uh, the requirements of, of this quote unquote product, starts with discoverability. Right? It's the ability to find and identify great sports experiences from those that are run by established sports organizations like U.S. Soccer or Pop Warner to the CrossFit for Kids to other kinds of activities as well. We defined broad, uh, broadly the idea of sports opportunities. One of the things we talked about was the idea that it's not just organized sports, but it might be programs that are run by after school, aftercare programs. It might be programs that are run by schools. It may be programs that are run in the community that just a group of parents have organized a, a kick-the-can tournament or a kickball tournament. It's the idea that as a parent, you want to make sure you create a great experience and, and understand what those great experiences are for your children. And it doesn't necessarily matter who's the one that's providing it, as long as you could discover the broad range of those opportunities. So the concept of this tool is to think really broadly when it comes to sport. The product itself will have filtering capability. So much like... Uh, and I'm not really a pretentious guy that needs to go to places where I valet park, except when it's raining. Uh, but much like you can use Yelp to figure out, you know, valet parking and what's the nearest place and is it opening? Does it have waiter service? The ability, imagine being able to filter those experiences by, hey, does this organization provide transportation? Do they offer grants or subsidies? Um, do they have uh, coaches that are certified and trained? Um, you know, whatever those kinds of criteria you might set, um, you might have the ability to filter. And so that filtering capability helps you get to those right kinds of experiences. The next is this concept of trust and verification. So not only are you discovering these experiences and filtering to find the right ones, but it's the ability to have certain kinds of, of information that helps you verify that you're, these are the right information, right? Maybe you're bringing in the fact that uh, the coaches in this organization are all certified, and that gives you confidence. Maybe it's the fact that you can find out that, hey, four or five of your neighbors or people that you're connected to on Facebook have all participated in that organization. Maybe there is uh, a great stamp of approval from various nonprofits and organizations that, uh, that are working with coaches or local community organizations that you can pull in that data as well. But anything that you can do to give trust and comfort that it's going to be a great experience for your child. And then down the road, I think you can see how this, this product might include things like an assessment or education tool. So imagine a parent or a child answering 20 or 25 different questions that helps identify what might be great experiences for them. And in the process, actually educate them to the idea of giving a rich multi-sport experience to their kids or, or, or the kinds of things they should be asking, like, wow, I never even thought about asking if the coaches were certified. But now this idea has been put in my head by virtue of some of the assessment and questions we might offer. And then there's even the concept around um, the idea of aggregation or, or tools to actually create your own sports experiences. So you imagine if you're a parent and you might be interested in kickball, but there may not be a kickball opportunity. Maybe there's an, a, an ability just to, to post and identify, hey, I want to organize this. Are other people interested? And pull people into the community. Or perhaps it's, it's helping a coach identify tools to say, hey, this community doesn't have an activity right here, but here's tools where you can go ahead and start your own kickball tournament, your own league, or your own activity. And then lastly, the ability for reporting and gaps analysis. If truly you're sitting on all this information that already exists and you're pulling it in, 
you, what you're going to be able to do is not only identify where there are great experiences, but actually where they're not. And so in the same respect as some of the mapping ideas and everything else that came up, I think we have an ability to identify where those gaps of experiences are and then therefore help those organizations whose mission it is to fill those gaps uh, really act effectively. And so I think that data becomes useful. So again, it's, it's this, this concept of a tool for discovery for great sports experiences. Now, how do you ultimately execute this? Well, the, the technology isn't all that complicated, right? And I think we saw any number of examples where this exists. You know, the, the concept is that it would be multi-platform. So one of the things we thought was important is not just being web-based, but being mobile as well, tablet-enabled. So wherever and however you're accessing this information, you're doing so optimally. And then the other thing is important is the idea that this is something that is distributed, right? It's almost like a widget, where it not only has to live in a centralized website where everyone goes to one place, but more importantly, this is information that you could literally take and access in lots of different places, right, and embed that in lots of sites. And one of the advice that, that came up in the group is trying to figure out where the users are and go to them as opposed to try to make them come to you. And so I think that distributed mindset is, is once you're sitting on top of this information, is how you syndicate this out, right? Um, the two other challenges to make this work is, one, how do you get the information, right? How do you populate where all these experiences are coming from? And I think the good news is, is whether it's a nonprofit organization or a for-profit organization, whether it's organized sports or an aftercare nonprofit, all, uh, after-school nonprofit, all those organizations have a common goal, which is to increase the number of participants in their program. So if they believe that this is a, a vehicle by which they can increase participation, they'll likely be willing to share that information. And there's lots of expertise in the group to suggest that they'd be interested in sharing it because they want to recruit and increase the number of participants. I think the other thing is, is that there are organizations, companies like myself, that is actually sitting on this data. So actually, without the organizations having to do anything, you can actually create feeds of data and APIs uh, that basically would populate this information of sports activities that are happening in any given area. And if there are other companies that are willing to join the publication of that information, it could happen in a way that's very automated, as opposed to things that have to be updated manually. Then the last question is, is great, you have all this information, you have this great site or this widget, how do you get the users, right? And so that goes to the strategy of enlisting a set of partners that are actually able to reach the parents that we want to reach as well. So one of the suggestions was uh, the idea of healthcare providers, right, who are incentivized to make sure that families are thinking about being healthy and everything else, where they might be in a position to help distribute the tool or, or help parents understand the choices. Employers in the same way, where employers become a, a vehicle by which they, you know, whether it's through their intranet systems and whatnot, where they can help parents discover these options for their kids. Um, schools could be a really interesting mechanism for that. You know, you could get a summer reading list about what you're supposed to do over the summer, but why not have access as any parent, here's a list of activities that you can go ahead and find for your children over the course of the summer uh, and, uh, and, and link back to the conversation we had earlier today. Military could be another partner. Nonprofit or community organizations who are working with parents could use this tool as a way of helping people discover these opportunities. Faith-based organizations and even government. Uh, and government agencies are all in a position to potentially reach parents who are making decisions as it relates to things that they're doing with their children uh, and use this as a tool that's freely available to them to make that happen. So how, how do you make this vision a reality? One of the key things is, is really convening the different kinds of stakeholders. Right, the technology is not complicated. There's a, a way to get the data, but you need everyone to kind of get at the table to figure this out. And I think a perfect next step for people who are interested is to come to the table, potentially under the auspices of Aspen Institute, the Clinton Health Matters Initiative, I think, to figure this out. Uh, and then the idea of potentially a hackathon around this becomes an interesting way of figuring out how you build these data feeds and create the kinds of experiences uh, around it. Um, last things that I'll share and offer. How do you know this works? What's what really interesting is because you're sitting on top of all this information, you're in a position to probably measure the increase in participation, the increase of discovery of these kinds of opportunities. So whether it's getting non-participants to participate or infrequent participants to participate more, um, whether it's getting people to actually have more different kinds of sports experiences, those are all things that you should be able to measure from a tool like this. The final thing I'll point out is something we struggle with as a group, which is this question of access. Right? We wouldn't consider it successful if all you did is made this tool available and the only experiences that were available or the only parents participating were those in areas that already had access to sports experiences, even if it, that wasn't optimal in the status quo. So we think that there are enough experiences that are happening in enough organizations that are happening in these lower income communities or happening in rural areas, that simply the discoverability of those things will help. But what are, it probably isn't enough. And there's still going to be a gap. And this, as, as, an, as a tool, cannot solve all those problems. But there's three things we thought about to kind of address that concern. 
One is the ability for potentially crowdfunding, which is once you begin helping parents identify the opportunities that exist in, in, in their more fortunate areas, you can also highlight the need for those experiences elsewhere and potentially help create those kinds of connections and bonds. At a minimum, you also highlight the gaps for action. So now you understand, hey, these organizations, these areas don't, aren't being served by these organizations, or these sports are missing, so now we can focus our resources and attention. And then thirdly is potentially tools where parents themselves or coaches could actually have access to things to organize their own events, their own tournament. Uh, and then those could be accessible via the platform as well. So that's kind of the vision of what we came up with and, and this idea of creating uh, this marketplace uh, really fun, uh, around this tool that, that accesses uh, the information that's out there and helps parents uh, and kids make, uh, make choices to get great experiences. So that's what we got. Any questions or comments? All right. Yes, we're going. Yes. Maybe just one one thing uh, as you're talking about the access. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it seems like you could you could have a function there so that if, if parents are searching for something, expressing a demand, um, and not finding anything, you could share that with activity providers and say, "Here's a demand. Go there." Yeah. No. One of the things that we do in the technology sometimes, if like if we're thinking about offering a new subscription offering. Before we even do anything, we'll have put a button up there saying, hey, subscribe. And if people click on it, they'll get the next page will say, oh, this, this isn't available now. Check back later. But if we get enough clicks, we'll be like, we should just offer a subscription because we put up this button and now everyone's clicking through. So the same concept's there. If, if 100 parents in a particular area are, are, are clicking through um, for CrossFit for kids, but they're getting to not finding any of those opportunities, you now have that information that you can then begin to share with those organizations. So I think it's a great point. And it, and it becomes something that you can share within, within the community. Yes? Just one thought. You know, I, I'm sure it's true in other communities, but up in Portland where I am, every year there are uh, editions of the local weekly. Willamette Week is the one up there. You've got East Bay Express here and ones in San Francisco where every summer camp and summer program under the sun is paying to put an ad in that, in that one special edition that comes out around March or April to give parents a chance to plan their kids' summers. And so I think there actually is potentially a revenue feed to support this in a really significant way, um, at least once a year <laughs> right. for summer planning. Um, but there might be others as well. Yeah, there's, what, what's interesting about this is there's, there's at least a sustainable model here. I mean, it could also be an uh, affiliate fee basis, so yeah. where you have at least for-profit organizations or whatnot, where if you're driving participants to them, then those organizations, especially if they're paying to participate, would pay you back a referral or affiliate fee that would go back to support the kind of underpinning or the running and operating of this. Yeah. Uh, and in the case of nonprofits, you, you wouldn't necessarily charge them at all. So I think that the instinct, though, is right, is that there's, there's sustainable revenue models beyond just the con concept of advertising or sponsorship, which is a lot harder, that, that one can think about that keeps the site uh, kind of operating. Well, it really is. Advertising, it is pretty like, this is a captive audience for these people who are going to find a lead to go do something. So a yeah. lot of these sportswear providers and all of these kind of things. Oh. Yeah, I mean, we, maybe we would make the decision that well, you're not going to sell advertising to, like, Burger King, but you could certainly sell it to, like, Hastings, right? Sure. And, so, and maybe instead of if the advertising, what they're actually doing is paying for grants. So right. for, right. for like, if a parent finds an opportunity but they don't have the money, they could apply for grants that those those advertisers have funded or whatnot. So. But it, this definitely would produce or provide functionality that's a big step up from what's now where you have parents flipping through trying to find camps to right. mentoring and everything would be. And one of the things we said is that the summer camp analogy, there are places and sites where people are going to to figure out summer camps, especially for more fortunate parents who are doing that, uh, bringing that analogy here. And that's part of the reason why the, the concept of the technology is not the focus. I think they Yeah, well, so uh, one of the things to balance out in that model is uh, the trustworthiness of the data. And, you know, uh, you know there's, there's planted Yelp reviewers, there's, there's paid. So the whole Angelist model that we talked about in our group as far as can you pay your way into this or not right. as, a, as a service provider. Right. Great. Any other question? Yes. Just another observation, particularly on the access piece. It, I think the biggest question is whether we're helping people make better choices or make new choices. And I, I think the new choices piece is the toughest nut to crack. Um, we, we learned that the hard way. We created an online tool to let communities self-organize to build playgrounds. Um, and it was successful, but it was only successful in higher income communities uh, because they had the resources and assets in the community to do the self-organizing. Mm -hmm. um, so it didn't really create new choices for the target audience that we were going for. 
Yeah, and I think what's interesting, I think it's a fair point, and I think the realistically what, what probably has to happen is where you identify kind of underserved communities where they need new choices but those aren't provided. I think as the, the point was made earlier, one is if all of a sudden there's data about demand, it makes that easier, right? So the extent that you can show that there's interest but that there isn't the available uh, experiences, then that information, whether it's for for-profit or non-profit entities, become useful. And then perhaps there are other initiatives through the auspices of Asking Institute or other organizations that can focus on tackling that problem. So it's, you know, I think the tools are going to take you so far, but I think as your point, there probably are more structural issues that has to be addressed to figure that out. And I know, I think that's a separate issue I know I think a lot about um, where you, how you provide and seed folks to go into those areas and uh, have the tools they need technologically and otherwise to succeed. That's a really good point. Yes. The, um, and I was at this, uh, at this table, um, I think we also recognize, just to underscore, this is a very complex enterprise. I mean, because it's not really just technology, it, it, it's mobilizing at the, at the community level and so forth. So, uh, but, but we did think that um, this literally is game changing if we could achieve this. And, and just last point, it, it's not just sports participation, but it's the sports experience becoming even more enjoyable, safer, and that sort of thing. So these are elements built into it that, that the sports experience is, is uh, providing adequate increased physical activity. It has all these benefits. So it's like anything, it, you know, the, the more expectations you build into it, the more uh, c complex and sophisticated it becomes. But this did hold together, I think, as we kind of tested it uh, in two bouts, and, and, and it developed really well. Yeah, thank you. Any other comments? All right, I guess we're going to the vote. We got ten. All right, we got another winner. All right. Terrific. Good job, Jeremy. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'd like to talk about next steps here. Uh, there's several. Um, you know, a lot of terrific ideas here today. Um, we're going to help you push them forward in several ways. Uh, first of all, um, we're going to send out a post-event survey. Um, which will get your thoughts on how you feel like the meeting went, how you'd like to engage moving forward, how your organization might be helpful to the process. Uh, that should go out in the next uh, two or three days. Uh, and then after that, we will send out a report by Emily, who is at the table back there. Who, uh, you know, sometime in the next couple of weeks, she'll kind of roll through all the transcripts and uh, put together a six to eight page report summarizing what the summarizers uh, you know, uh, mention with the product as well as, um, you know, interval training and the summer break. What do we do with that? Uh, capture the poll results. And then that will then create an opportunity for, uh, uh, you'll probably get a note from Ginny Ehrlich from the, from the Clinton Foundation saying, okay, how do we want to move forward on this here? Um, and she can begin to help you convene on these ideas. Uh, it's, you know, um, we can sort of frame these conversations, but um, really, you're going to be the drivers. If anything gets done with these terrific ideas that have been presented today, it's going to be because it's going to be because you continue to show energy uh, about really, you know, developing them, you know, to the point where you know maybe in January when we when we put the summit together and we release the project play report, we can, uh, you know, we, we really have something to show the world at that time. So keep the energy high, keep it going. Uh, in the meantime, um, today we're going to send out a link that Julie has created for a Google Plus community, which I referenced earlier. Uh, has not existed before. It's a terrific option for us to uh, continue to dialogue with each other um, on these topics. And uh, you know, there'll be uh, categories for each one of the big ideas, as well as you know, uh, uh, summer summer break and uh, and. Uh, Interval training and also a general discussion area where you can dump your notes, you can collaborate. Uh, now, I'd imagine uh, how many people in this room currently use uh, the Google Plus community feature? Oh, actually, more than I thought. Okay, well, there are a few who haven't, so that's terrific. All right, so Julia is going to come up here and give us a demonstration uh, on what she'll show 